this is Striker of Enyo, and this is the series, What's It Like? And we're taking a look today at Broken Sword number five, The Serpent's Curse. So if you're any kind of fan of adventure games, especially the point and click ones, you probably have come across or encountered a Broken Sword game at some point. They've been around since the 90s, and you're probably wondering, hey, I've played some other games, is this one any good? It looks kind of interesting, and my honest opinion is... Fuck no, no, this game is fucking horrible. I hate it, I hate it, I don't care what the scores are, the dialogue is insipid, it sounds like people are reading their lines, the voice work is flat, the dialogue is cliche, I just couldn't get into this game whatsoever. But it was easy achievement slash trophies, so I still completed it. But yeah, this is not going to be a review. But I am going to show you some of the cliches, some of the dialogue, some of the story elements. So if this looks good to you and it's cheap someday, maybe you want to check it out. But for the most part, most other people are better off playing previous games in the series. You can probably get through it in about six and a half hours. If you know exactly what you're doing, you're still looking at a good five hours, give or take. But yeah, I just don't see the quality. I just don't like the writing, and I never really get invested with the characters too much. I know it's a Kickstarter game, and we need to give these kind of things a little bit of leeway, but I mean, good writing's good writing, right? And I just don't think it's here. But hey, this is Broken Sword 5. Let's take a look at the game itself. Uh, so here we are, Broken Sword 5. You know, I actually bought the original two Broken Sword games on the original PlayStation 1, and I thought they were, you know, decent graphic adventures. But, but this game... This game kind of feels like I'm kicking a puppy. I mean, this was a Kickstarter game that uh, earned about just under a million dollars, so it's relatively inexpensive. I believe it only has about four programmers total that worked on it. Uh, you know, obviously there's a bigger team that, you know, did some of the art and some of the other stuff. But, you know, good writing is good writing, right? I mean, even if it was made on the cheap, and I honestly, if you see this game for 5 or $7 on sale, I really can't recommend it. I like adventure games, I really do, but this just is riddled with a bunch of cliches and bad writing and... Passion. I mean, this thing was made in 2013 with a, a part two that came out in 2014. I just kind of really expect a little bit better. I mean, I understand your unlimited resources and whatnot. I mean, I, I, I get that. I really do. But I really expect my writing in an adventure game to be a lot better. And I've heard it's actually been better in the series, of course, as well. So, yeah, I mean, a, a painting gets stolen from a family, like, back in the 1940s, and it ends up in this gallery in modern day where it gets stolen again, and, like, that's, that's your plot. Oh, yeah, a guy gets shot, of course, on the way out, and you're, I guess, meant to figure out who the killer are, the killer is, but you basically work for an insurance company? Like, that's who you are? So, uh, I don't know. It's a lot of contrived stuff. So take this with a grain of salt. We're going to be looking at some of the details that I just find annoying in this game. And yes, of course, somebody died, so there needs to be a priest. And sometimes some of the writing gets a little preachy, and I don't understand where it comes from or why there's characters that talk like this. The others? The pretty women who show who gossip, who have their spa days, their... Uh, that bad, huh? And the men with their good... Clatter! I see your point. This is what we fought on the barricades for, madame. Ripped up the paving slabs, bled on the streets. Isn't it? Bled on the streets? The barricades? Are we talking about World War II here? This is a present-day game. I mean... This means that, you know what, you're in your 30s? You should have been born in like in the late 70s? You didn't, you weren't here in the barricades. You didn't bleed on the streets. What the fuck are you talking about, man? Why do adventure games need to have characters that are so fucking out of whack with real people, you can't relate to it? He serves coffee only to thinkers and philosophers? Fuck you, man! 
question. Oh, uh, so I all I had to do all of that just to get a cup of coffee because I need to give it to this guy. But then he refuses it because he cannot drink the coffee because of his little problem. So this is a little It is a tale of an onion. Well since you seem quite Oh, this is gonna take some time. Please do. I was in charge of He was in charge of canine security for the president's dog. Like really? So just, all I need to do is give this guy a cup of coffee. I give him a cup of coffee. Apparently it goes straight through him. He needs to pee, so he leaves so I can get into the gallery. That is my goal. But literally, just before I'm about to try to finish my goal, I have to go through... Admittedly, you can skip dialogue, but it's three minutes of this dialogue of him telling this story. And why he apparently does not let himself ever drink coffee on duty. God, it is so dumb. It is so stupid. And and seriously, these are the first, like the first hour of the game, the first 30 minutes. It's painful. I mean, I'm sorry, but I, I just don't like the writing. I mean, does it feel like it's something that you guys like? Oh yeah, then there's this pizza stain on the ground. You're trying to make it look like it's a blood stain so you can get the uh, inspector of this crime scene to look away long enough so that the other character can do something else. So obviously I need to get the chewing gum out of the tomato stain. And of course I have to use my press pass in order to do it. Oh, but not, not on the tomato stain itself. You have to get the cursor right on the chewing gum. And yes, the chewing gum attached to my card will be used later to solve another puzzle. What the fuck? So you sneak into the office and you find the security footage that clearly shows you and the assailant there. And, uh, oh yeah, apparently he has a logo on his bike, on his motorcycle helmet, that will clearly link him to a company that he bought it from only a matter of a few days away. Really? We're going to use that cliche? And then there's the dumb cliche French inspector that is so dumb he reminds you of Inspector Clouseau from the Pink Panther. But he has his own stupidity as well. And yeah, he actually thinks that I am the one who shot the guy and stole the painting, even though... There's at least three witnesses, if not four, in the exact same room that clearly saw the guy and me exist in time and space at the exact same time. Not to mention that the security footage you just saw also showed that we are not the same fucking person. Who fucking wrote this? And apparently the reason the security system didn't go off when the painting was stolen is because... The security firm is also fake? I mean, seriously, this is way too elaborate. I mean, you couldn't have just had somebody disable it, right? It's gotta be, they're in on it too, huh? And then there's the morality of the main characters themselves. If you don't let me in, I'll tell the police about your interesting connection to the security company. Yeah, our main characters actually, uh, instead of using clever dialogue and talking their way into situations, uh, they actually steal evidence and threaten people quite a bit in the game. Oh yeah, and of course, in classic uh, adventure game fashion, you have to light a match next to a door in order to reveal the fact that there is a fucking light switch next to you, because of course, there is no other way to know there's a light switch there unless I light a match and reveal it to all to fucking see. Oh, what the hell. So, rather quickly, I actually find the murder weapon. It doesn't really matter. But, lo and behold, the French inspector is literally there to catch me red-handed the moment I pick it up. Inspector, I mean... Look, if, if, look, game, if you wanted this guy to think that I was the murderer, there's a way you could have written it into the story and actually made it work and make sense. But the fact is, is that earlier you already established that me and the murderer existed in the same room at the same time, and there were four witnesses that all saw that clearly I wasn't the guy that shot the owner of the store. But they keep hammering this home like this inspector is so dumb... He doesn't believe it. 
Why? So as I'm playing the game and recognizing a lot of these cliche tropes from murder mysteries, I was kind of surprised that the main killer didn't have a recognizable tattoo of some kind, right? I mean, that's what you do when you're a writer that really can't think of any other way to link a murderer or killer to something else. Is you just give them a do What? The game actually gives them a highly fucking visible and recognizable tattoo with the word headhunters on it? What the kind of fucking stupid are you from? You wear a bike helmet that's recognizable and can be traced to you in a matter of a couple of days, and you wear short sleeves that have a highly visible tattoo on it, and you rob them in the middle of the day. What kind of fucking stupid are you? And then there's this guy that kind of puts the moves on you, and it's like, really? It's already going to be established in the game later on that he's in a committed relationship with someone. But no, apparently right now, at this moment, he wants to put champagne in me and then fuck me. It's like, really? Do we need to have a Bill Cosby moment in this game where I'm going to end up woken up somewhere else and I'm not going to know where I was and I got fucking semen all over me? God damn it. <laughs> no, I forgot about this part. So there's an old guy that shows up later that claims that he owns the painting in question. And we're like, well, how can you prove it? And he's like, oh, here, look at this old photograph. That guy in the middle, he's my dad. You see that ugly fucking piece of jewelry? Well, that belongs to him. And then he gave me that piece of jewelry, which I have today. And clearly this is a family photo. So you can see the painting in question in the background. So therefore, the painting belongs to my family and therefore it belongs to me. And I'm like, yep, I think any judge in the court would automatically assume that, yes, you have proven, sir, that you owned that painting uh, in the 1940s, and therefore you should own it today because you brought me this piece of fucking shit jewelry that is in the photograph. So since this is a modern day adventure game, that means we have cell phones. So I call the motorcycle bike helmet company and say, hey, did this guy with this distinguished tattoo come and buy a helmet off of you a couple of days ago? And they're like, oh yeah, he did. Uh, we don't know his name, but here's his address. Like, well, that was fucking simple. Thanks, game. That is the Can we ever ask? It is possible. I see. So after a while, you start to kind of realize that a lot of the voice work is pretty flat. I mean, some characters are okay, but for the most part, it really does seem like everyone's just reading their lines. So out of all the other cliches that have happened up to this point, I didn't think they were going to pull in the recognizable brand of cigarettes. But yeah, sure enough... Someone smokes a recognizable brand of cigarettes, they leave the butts somewhere, and oh, it just happens that the bad guy has them in his house as well. I beg your pardon. Oh yeah, and the incompetent French uh, inspector, he has this massive machine that is supposed to be able to tell whether or not this is a blood stain on the floor. You know, this is supposed to be modern days. Uh, anyone who's watched episodes of CSI knows about cotton swabs and whatnot, and there are easier ways to tell whether this is actual real blood. So if the cliched writing and the overuse of the crime investigation tropes isn't enough for you, this is where the game officially lost me and crossed the line. I disguise myself as the dead guy so I can gain a favor from this lady who happens to be the dead guy's lover. So that's right, this lady is in heartbreak because her lover was shot in the gallery and I disguise myself as him in order to get a key from her so I can gain access to a new area in the game. What the fuck, game designers? You honestly couldn't think of a better way for me to get the key from this lady than me dressing up as her dead love interest? What the fuck is wrong with you? I tore hair off of a stuffed dog and put it on my face. How fucked up is that? George, a moment, if you please. Come on, I'm supposed to go to the gallery. Every time I need to go somewhere that's clearly defined, I get sucked into these two to three minute conversations that, yeah, I can skip, but I mean, I have to kind of partially listen to them because I don't know if there's going to be something interesting in them. I mean, I know, I know it's a Kickstarter game. They don't have infinite resources, blah, 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 but it's three and a half hours into the game and I'm still going back to this tea shop. I'm having multiple conversations with multiple sets of people. I'm going back to the gallery. I'm going back to the office in the gallery over and over again. 
lies. And then the game hits you with this bombshell. The fact that the priest needs to tell you about a cult called the Gnostics that are bringing forth Lucifer, and apparently they have an artifact of unseen power that is capable of undoing the whole of creation. What the fuck? I mean, this is actually based on real-world events. I mean, they actually did find Gnostic Gospels at one point in the real world, but this group actually doesn't exist anymore? And there's no one that really follows their stuff because there's really only one copy of their Gospels that we kind of found, and it's kind of questionable about where that stuff came from. But this is the game now. This is what you're doing. You're trying to eradicate the Gnostics because they are trying to bring about an end of the world. Jesus. So it's true. Good scan talk. Only it went really enemy. Josh has a real thing about goats. I know. And then there's this part where there's a talking goat. And seriously, it's not dumb enough that the guy talks like this with the bouncing of his voice and whatnot and repeating stuff. But this conversation actually goes on for like two full minutes. Two full minutes of this goat talking. Not only was it stupid in the first place, but you have an entire conversation with this goddamn goat. will descend upon you, etc., etc. God damn it, I hate the writing. So, by the end of part one, everything is completely swept under the rug. No, I mean, seriously, the French inspector, uh, his accusations toward you, the fact you had the murder weapon in your hands, the guy with the tattoo, all that is basically done and wrapped up by the end of part one, and then that's when the whole Gnostic cult thing kicks into high gear for the second part. Uh, I mean, seriously, th there's a reason why the Gnostics really didn't live that much longer in history is because their stuff was pretty far-fetched. I mean, they saw uh, both God and Lucifer as both being gods of different things, and if you know your Sunday school uh, lessons at all, you know that, you know, Lucifer is actually an angel and that God created him, so Lucifer doesn't have any extraordinary powers or ultimate, you know, world-ending uh, abilities, I mean... He was created by God. He doesn't have anything more than what God originally gave him. So, but I know it's, it's a movie or it's a video game, right? We have to build some of these things up. But I mean, if this is your thing, then this is the direction that the game goes. And you have uh, complicated ciphers that you got to solve and other puzzles. Uh, for the most part, the two different sections of the game just kind of seem uneven. I mean, the puzzles are, for the most part, logical and whatnot as far as adventure games go, but yeah, when you start to get to decrypting ciphers and whatnot in the second part, and you gotta do a couple of them, they're not necessarily hard, but I mean, they're complicated, and it, it you, you just feel like you don't wanna go on after a while. If this kind of history of the Gnostics, you know, interests you and their beliefs and whatnot, I mean, maybe you want to check this game out, but for me, the writing isn't strong enough and the voice acting really doesn't carry it too much further. So, for the most part, I think people should pass on this game. Try the other games in the series, they're definitely better, but yeah, you could probably skip this one.